Dr. Kirk. I'm the Executive and Scientific Director of the Alliance for Natural Health. Um, the ANH is a um, European uh, health freedom organization that's working to protect and promote natural health care worldwide. Avid newspaper readers will have seen that there are quite regular articles, often headline articles, that have suggested that supplements either don't work or may be dangerous. The important thing to appreciate about these studies is that they are studies conducted using synthetic forms of vitamins and minerals that are produced by pharmaceutical companies. And the bottom line is that these studies are often completely in conflict from the epidemiological and observational studies that have shown that people who consume higher level of nutrients that can be found in healthy diets or take natural forms of, of food supplements and dietary supplements have a substantially improved um, health outcome, particularly in terms of chronic diseases like cancer risk, um, heart disease risk, osteoporosis, etc. The catch cry from most government authorities around the world is that you get enough vitamins and minerals and other micronutrients in your diet. The bottom line is, let me rephrase that because I said bottom line last time. <laughs> The catch cry from many health authorities around the world, and certainly in the EU, is that we all get enough vitamins, minerals and other micronutrients in our diet. The reality is that there's virtually no evidence to sh show this. Many of us are very deficient in particular minerals and even certain vitamins. Um, in particular, if we look at uh, minerals such as zinc, if we look at uh, women at certain life stages, Iron is nearly always deficient. Most of us are very deficient in magnesium. It's particularly important as we get older um, as one of the minerals that's important in reducing heart disease risk. If we look at um, vitamins as well, um, there are numerous vitamins that, that many of us are short on. Um, and the other issue is what is the baseline from what we measure adequacy? And of course, many people, many scientists, many clinical nutritionists now have a major issue with the reference nutrient intakes or the recommended daily allowances that are often um, very inadequate when it comes to determining the optimum level of certain nutrients. So if we take vitamin C for example, the adequacy is measured around the 60 milligrams, which is the RDA, the, average, the recommended daily allowance for vitamin C of 60 milligrams a day. And that is certainly not what the science would suggest if we want to take a level of vitamin C that is adequate. Um, and uh, taking levels that are in excess of one gram is actually a common and well-supported view from a large amount of research. 60 milligrams is what you might find in, say, a single orange if the orange hasn't been in cold storage for many, many months. Um, the, the amounts that we actually need to take would need to be 10, 100 times more than this. And of course, we, needn't, we don't get maximum benefit if we take these sorts of water-soluble vitamins in a single dose. What we need to do is spread their intake throughout the day. Apart from vitamins and minerals, there are other extremely important categories of macronutrients that are found in food supplements. One of the very important categories is botanicals, those nutrients that are derived from plants. And if we look at people's diet, what we find is that there are certain fruits and vegetables that are very deficient in the diet of most people that have extremely important properties. And if we look, for example, at um, the anti-cancer nutrients within, for example, um, some of the um, brassica families, the cabbages, the broccoli family, as well as that which can be found in the allium family, the uh, onions and garlic, for example, um, you'll find that um, those nutrients are actually make up only a very small proportion of the daily intake of most people. And um, so the food supplement industry actually provides a very important source for deriving these nutrients on a regular basis, on a daily basis, whether you're in season or out of season. Um, so they can make a very important contribution to uh, taking the sort of nutrients that are associated with reduced risk of chronic diseases. It's actually a peculiar situation to have arisen over the last 10 or so years to see so much legislation affecting natural health products. When one looks at the proven risk 
of this group of products. They're actually the safest group of products that we put in our mouths, much safer even than food, and certainly hundreds or thousand times safer than, uh, for example, drugs or tobacco or alcohol. And yet we see um, a disproportionate amount of legislation. Now, the primary stated reason, for, as far as the regulatory authorities are concerned for this, is that they need to do it for two reasons. One, to protect consumer health. And the interesting thing, when you look carefully at the type of legislation that is now being enacted and will be enacted over the next few years, it does very little to actually protect consumers from um, supplements that may um, be of poor quality um, and may actually pose some sort of risk to human health because, let's face it, anything can pose a risk to human health. And of course you can have uh, too much coffee and tea and there can be a risk from any type of uh, ingredient that we consume orally. The other major reason for all this legislation is trade. And because in Europe we have now 28 member states, a lot of major corporations have found it very inconvenient to have to relabel and reformulate products for all these different European markets. And they want to have a single European market where they can have one type of formulation that applies to all member states. The difficulty is if you're trying to keep everyone happy and you have particular member states that have had a very restrictive view on food supplements, such as Germany, such as Denmark, you end up appealing to the lowest common denominator. And the end result is within this harmonized environment, we are going to create a situation, unless it is stopped, where there will just be very low dose, very non-therapeutic, one a day type supplements that actually have virtually no health benefits associated with them at all. The effect of all this legislation has been really for individual member states to lose their own sovereignty, to lose the ability to control what they provide for their own populations. One of the reasons why a harmonized environment may not be a good thing is actually despite what we are hearing um, from the EU in terms of their justifications for all this regulation, is that there are considerably different lifestyle and dietary patterns in different parts of Europe. Here in Sweden, for example, you have many months of the year where it's very difficult to grow fresh produce and you are dependent on imports. It's a very different situation, for example, from that which uh, uh, someone who lives in the Mediterranean area in Spain or Italy or Greece may find themselves in where they have many more months in which uh, fresh fruits and vegetables can be bought from local markets and contain a very high level of, of many beneficial nutrients. Of course we have big differences in the amount of um, vitamin D that is produced as a result of sunlight exposure. We have also very different um, behavioral profiles and lifestyle profiles. Some In some parts of, of Europe, people are more active than in others. And it makes sense for governments within particular regions or countries to be looking out for their own populations. Under this new EU-based legislative system, it's a one-size-fits-all agenda in which the same regulation is applied to someone who lives in Italy as it is to someone who lives in Sweden. And that in effectively discriminates against both groups.